Hi, welcome to the lifetime of the tau lepton. So this is the first in a two-part series on measuring the lifetime of the tau lepton. In this video, we're going to give basically two things. First, the motivation for measuring the tau lifetime. And second, an overview of the experimental method used for measuring the tau lifetime. In the second video, which is entitled How the Measured Lifetime of the Tau Lepton Changed Over 30 Years, we'll look at the following. First, the evolution of the measured value of the Tau lifetime since the early 80s, which is due to the improvements in experimental precision. Second, how these experimental results can help us understand measurement errors. And third, a demonstration of how scientific understanding evolves over time. Now, most of the physics is going to be in this first video, but even if you're not so interested in the details of the numerical results over time, we would strongly recommend that you also watch the second video. So the stuff on error bars in the second video is useful for understanding measurements in general, not just this measurement of the tau lifetime. Okay. So before we go too much further, let's talk about what that picture is in the first slide of the video. So this picture is of a candidate tau plus tau minus production event from the archived data from the Aleph experiment. Let's see if we can understand what's going on in this picture. The Aleph detector was a cylindrical detector, and what we're seeing here is a cross section of the detector. The various concentric structures are different parts of the particle detector. In the detector, an electron and positron collide, and they annihilate in the center of the detector, and they produce a tau plus tau minus pair. In the case of this event, one of the candidate taus has gone off to the left, and one has gone off to the right. The taus each travel a short distance that is way too short to see in this picture, and then they decay into other particles. Some of those other particles leave tracks in the detector. The tau that went to the left in this picture decayed into one particle which left a track, and this is the red line on the left half of the diagram. The tau that went to the right decayed into three particles which left tracks in the detector. These can be seen as blue, green, and red tracks in the right side of the diagram. If you'd like some more background information, you can check out the video Discovery of the Tau Lepton, available on this channel. So in that video, we talk about the discovery of the Tau Lepton at Slack by the Mark I collaboration in the 1970s, and that discovery earned the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1995. Okay, so first, let's ask the question, why measure the Tau lifetime? In order to answer this question, let's first look at the quarks and leptons of the standard model. So the quarks and leptons of the standard model are arranged into three generations, and we show those three generations here. Here the quarks are in the two top lines, and the leptons are in the two bottom lines. So for example, the first generation of quarks and leptons consists of the up quark and the down quark, and then the electron and its partner neutrino. The second generation consists of the charm quark and the strange quark, the muon and its partner muon neutrino. And finally, the third generation consists of the top quark, the bottom quark, the tau lepton, and the tau's partner neutrino, the tau neutrino. Now, as far as we know, these three generations are identical except for the masses of the particles. So for example, the electron and the muon act identically except that the electron and the muon have different masses. Okay, so now that we've seen the quarks and leptons of the standard model, let's talk about how they interact. 
So the quarks and leptons interact via the gauge bosons. The gauge bosons in the standard model are the photon, which is represented by the Greek letter gamma, the Z boson, the W plus and minus bosons, and the gluons, which are represented by the letter G. Now, the three generations have identical interactions with the gauge bosons in the standard model. And specifically, if we're talking about the leptons in the standard model, this standard model principle that the three generations have the same interactions is called lepton universality. So let's look at an example of lepton universality. So in the standard model, we have a gauge boson called the W. Here, let's imagine that the W is coming in from the upper left corner of the screen. We're going to represent the W as a wavy line. Now, the W boson can decay to other particles. One of the ways in which it can decay is to an electron and an electron antineutrino. And I'll note that here we are using the convention that arrows are reversed on the lines for antiparticles. So here the electron antineutrino is the antiparticle of the electron neutrino. And because it's an antiparticle, we draw its line with its arrow in the opposite direction that we naively would. So the process that this diagram represents is that the W minus is traveling along and suddenly it decays. So it disappears and is replaced with an electron and an electron antineutrino. Now, this is not the only way that a W minus boson can decay. Another way that it can decay is to a muon and a muon antineutrino. And additionally, it can also decay to a tau and a tau antineutrino. Now, importantly, the interaction that controls all three of these decays is the same, regardless of whether the W is decaying to an electron and an electron antineutrino, or a muon and a muon antineutrino, or a tau and a tau antineutrino. Because the electron, muon, and tau are leptons, along with their associated neutrinos and antineutrinos, this is an example of lepton universality. But, importantly, we have no idea why there are three generations of quarks and leptons. And, while the standard model has identical interactions with gauge bosons for the three generations, the standard model may not be the correct theory of nature. So, therefore, we should look for violations of lepton universality. And one way to do this is to look and see if the tau has interactions that the electron and muon don't have. Okay, so in order to do that, first let's look at how taus decay in the standard model. So here we have a tau coming in from the upper left-hand corner of the screen. The tau then disintegrates into a tau neutrino and a W boson. The W boson further disintegrates. As we saw before, it can disintegrate into an electron and an electron antineutrino, or a muon and a muon antineutrino. However, the W minus boson can also decay into a quark antiquark pair. In the case of tau decays, the relevant possible combinations of quark and antiquark are that we have an up type antiquark and either a down quark or a strange quark. So once this quark-antiquark system is produced, the quark and antiquark will still interact with each other to form particles called hadrons. There are many different ways in which this process can take place, and that means that the tau can actually decay to many different types of particles. Okay, so now we know how the tau decays in the standard model, 
But what if the tau has other new interactions that we don't know about? These new interactions could change how often the tau decays via the aforementioned routes, or it could introduce new ways for it to decay. And these changes can affect the tau lifetime. So the tau lifetime may be sensitive to violations of lepton universality. And therefore, we should measure it. OK, now let's talk about how the experiments measured the tau lifetime. In the second video, entitled How the Measured Lifetime of the Tau Lepton Changed Over 30 Years, we'll look at 16 different measurements of the tau lifetime. And while the details differ between the experiments, the big picture idea of how the lifetime was measured was the same for all of them. So basically, in each of the experiments, they collided an electron with its antiparticle, the positron. So here, we have an electron and a positron coming in from the left side of the screen, and they collide. When they collide, they produce either a Z boson or a photon. And then that Z or photon disintegrates into a tau plus tau minus pair. So what happens in the experimental apparatus is the following. An electron and a positron come in from opposite directions and collide. They are annihilated, and in their place, a tau plus and a tau minus are produced. The tau plus and tau minus travel some distance, and then they decay into other particles. The idea is to measure the distance that the tau plus or tau minus flew between where it was produced and where it decayed. From the energy of the collision, we can figure out what the speed of the tau plus or tau minus is. And so given the distance that it went before it decayed, we can figure out how long the tau plus or tau minus lived before it decayed. And in case you know something about special relativity and are wondering, yes, you do have to include the effects of relativistic time dilation. If you don't, your results will not make any sense. So let's take another look at that Aleph tau plus tau minus candidate event that we saw at the beginning of the video. Here we've taken that candidate event and we've zoomed in very tightly on the region around where the tau plus and tau minus would have been produced. So here the red arrow shows the region where the tau plus and tau minus were presumably produced. One of the taus went off to the left and one went off to the right. Now, if we consider just the one that went off to the right, we can look at what's going on in the area of the blue arrow. So we don't detect the tau plus or tau minus itself. Instead, we detect the particles that the tau plus or tau minus decays to. So the particles that the tau plus or tau minus decays to will leave tracks in the detector. And we need to extrapolate those tracks back to a region where they approximately meet. So if you look closely in the region pointed to by the blue arrow, there are actually three lines. One is blue, one is red, and one is green. These are the extrapolations of tracks that are observed in the detector. And they approximately meet in the area shown by the green arrow. So we know that the tau plus and tau minus were produced in the general region of the red arrow. We also know that one of them decayed in the region of the green arrow. We can therefore measure the distance between the region in front of the red arrow and the region in front of the green arrow, and we can figure out how far the tau went before it decayed. And from that, we can calculate a lifetime. OK. So let's summarize what we've seen so far. So far, we've seen the motivation for measuring the tau lifetime. 
and we've seen the basic experimental method for measuring the tau lifetime. In the second video in this series, we'll look at the following. We'll look at the actual experimental results. We'll see how they changed over time. From that, we'll learn some lessons on measurement error and how to interpret error bars. And finally, we'll also make some comments on how scientific knowledge progresses with time.